Greetings and thank you for participating in our Black Zomer series. My name is Kendra Washington Bass and I proudly serve as the chair of the Black Alumni of Notre Dame. Tonight is the second event in our Black History Month programming where we spend this month honoring and celebrating contributions of Black Domers as well as discussing aspects of Black life, politics, culture, entrepreneurship, well being, and spirituality. It is our hope that over the course of the next few weeks, we will build a community and connect with people globally to reflect upon the contributions made by the Black alumni. The Black alumni of Notre Dame was founded to enhance the presence and experiences of African-Americans across the Notre Dame family, students, faculty, administration, and alumni and alumni. We hope you'll find your time with the Black Domer series insightful, thought-provoking, engaging, and actionable. Our goal is to contribute to being a force for good for the Notre Dame family. At this time, I want to thank our co-sponsors of the Black Domer series, Think ND, Irish Compass, and of course, the Notre Dame Alumni Association. But I especially want to thank our special guests who continue to give their time and their genius to share their expertise and thoughts with us this evening. Now, if you have any questions for us this evening, please see the Google form that's going to be dropped into the chat. We will collect those questions along the way and there'll be a question and answer section and hopefully we'll be able to get to those. Now, if we don't, we'll have an opportunity to address those questions at subsequent sessions. This will allow us to absolutely facilitate some questions as effectively as possible and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Last week, we had the honor and privilege of learning about our BA legacy from those who have lived it and continue to enrich it. Tonight, we take a look at how we fight for social how we fight for social justice and how that runs in our veins. We have the opportunity to learn from three cultural historians and storytellers. You see, Black people honor our legacies through the use of storytelling. And I'm so humbled to know our moderator and two guests. I first met Dr. Scott Isles Barton when accompanying my mother, Karen Washington, who was a food justice a activist at a food justice event. Little did I know that he was an associate professor of cultural anthropology of African diaspora foodways at Notre Dame. Just never knew. Christine Ashford Swanson and I were classmates studying communication and film from 1990 to 1994. And I've definitely been a fan of Ms. Anjanu Ellis Taylor who embodies the characters that she portrays. This evening is especially special, and I want to thank each of them for gracing us with their presence. At this time, I want to welcome Dr. Barton, and I hope that you enjoy the conversation. Dr. Barton. Dr. Robton, I think you're um, you're still muted. So we wanna just check your camera and check your volume. All right, so as Dr. Barton is trying to get, um, we have just some slight te technical difficulties, we'll continue. Um, as I was sharing a little bit earlier, we had this awesome opportunity to speak to three historians and storytellers and of course, the month of, of February is an opportunity to uplift our voices. And so what I would like to do at this time is bring on our wonderful two guests and then we'll bring Scott Barton on in just a moment. I wanna introduce you to, again, my beautiful classmate. I'm so happy that we've stayed in touch all these years. Christine Swanson, who is the founder of Faith Filmworks. And she is a director um, accredited with a number of different 
um, uh, films and television shows, some you have seen. And I think the most significant recently, which is how we are connected with Miss Andrew Ellis Taylor, is the Clark Sisters story. So I want to bring on Miss Christine Swanson. Hey, Christine. Hey there. How you doing? We're good. We're good. I'm so glad that you are with us today. And um, I'm looking forward to the conversation. I was hoping to really kind of sit back, relax and enjoy this. But I am glad that I'm having the privilege to even just be able to interchange with you and listen to your ideas. So how have things have been going with you lately? Very well. And <laughs> and the thing about the Clark sisters, that's where I first met uh, Miss Anjanou, uh, who's from Mississippi. And we we kind of bonded in 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 uh in in a creative way um working on the Clark Sisters movie. So Anjanu, talk about your experience of working on that. Yes, and Miss and Miss Ellis Taylor, thank you so, so much. I remember watching you in the help. I remember seeing you um of, of course, in the Clark Sisters. And most recently, two weeks ago, my family and I went to see Origin. And oh my goodness, we got a lot to unpack on that one. But you just embody the richness of Blackness and the story. So thank you so much for being here as well. It's my pleasure. It's thank my you. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Um, I, I want to hear those stories about Christine. <laughs> Girl, that's that's, that's beyond Black Doma series. Okay, that is that is a uh, that's a that's a that's a FX or something like that. <laughs> I love it. I love embarrassing her. I love it. She's blushing. So, so how did you two meet? And then after you answer that question, I'm gonna drop uh, back off, and and uh, Dr. Barton's gonna bring you on. But how did you two meet? We met on the. We met on. Um, well. I would say, I would say my friendship with Christine started before the Clark sisters. It the Clark sisters is what brought us together, but we would just have these epic conversations um, about about telling the story of these of these black women from Detroit, mm -hmm. and um, and they were coincidentally. You know, I, I, you know, people love can love the Clark sisters' music, yes. but they are personal heroes of mine. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it felt like a joke to that I would be playing their mother because mm -hmm. I, I, there are times in my life where I have literally stalked them. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we just started having these epic conversations, and I think that that was sort of like the prologue of our friendship, and then it was cemented on on the set. Yeah, so you can actually tell us some stories too that can add to uh, a, a nice journey of. So, what was Christine like? I got some from the '90s. You got some from the 2000s. So we can put together a nice memoir. What I love <laughs> about Christine Swanson, and I think what, yeah, I think why we're still friends now, is that I just think she's a fearless artist. Yes, she's a fearless artist. Thank you so, so much. That's all I got. <laughs> that's all you got. Okay. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye for right now, and I'm gonna introduce our my good friend Dr. Scott Barton, who is gonna take it away with some more conversation. And I'll see y'all back in a few. Yeah. Bye. Thank Hi you. and good evening. Good evening. I'm sorry that there was a little techno glitch. I don't know what's going on, but I'm here. Um, thank you both for being here. I'm a big fan of your work, uh, Ms. Ellis Taylor. And I'm, it's a treat. To, and I just, as uh, Kendra said, I just saw Origin myself, which if I can do a quick PSA, starting tonight through Sunday on campus, Origin will be screening every night. <gasps> and next week on Valentine's Day in the law school, if, you, if your friends weren't here tonight, please tell them they should come between 1230 and 1.30 the McCartan courtroom because Miss Swanson will be back and we'll be talking and screening Fanny there as well. So please know that they have two opportunities to catch both of these wonderful, talented women. Where, where is the screening to... on campus, Scott? Where In the law origin? school. No, where's origin screening every oh, day? Oh, on it's campus? at the, uh, the DeBartolo uh, Performing oh. Arts Center in wow. the Browning Cinema. That's awesome. That's a great uh, screening facility. 
No, it's wonderful. And it's a great opportunity. And it's a great opportunity for dialogue because it's a very important film. And I think it does work that's very interesting and distinct from the, the book um, in a very meaningful way. So I really encourage everybody to see it. And, you know, it's another opportunity in my mind. I think of you, Miss Ellis Taylor, in the same spirit as the old Roberta Flack record that was called Quiet Fire. Because I feel like when I see you on screen, your performances are so embedded in our culture, somebody might miss you because you're not doing the heavy lifting, grandstanding ego in front of the camera. You're just doing the work. And that comes across in Fanny, that you're just doing the work that needs to be done and talking about showing, reflecting back to us who we are as a people through the women that you choose to engage with. And so one of the things that I'm curious about that in addition to you having a great relationship with Ms. Swanson and Ms. Uh, Ava DuVernay, you have a relationship, as you was said earlier, with Mississippi. And I'm kind of curious how, since obviously you couldn't be with Fannie Lou Hamer to talk with her, to sit with her, how your youth in Mississippi informed this project since you have you you live there you went to Tougaloo for a while before you went to Brown etc yeah first of all I just want I don't know how that I don't know how origin is how that was arranged or what have you with um with origin playing at Notre Dame but I I wasn't ready for you to say that oh. and I thank you I thank you very much for that for doing it. I don't know who did it, but I thank you for that. Ricky Herbs, he's our programmer. He's a great guy and he really tries to be as close as he can to front row of things that are going on and culturally for students and faculty and people in the community to see. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for for, for supporting um the Fanny Short as well. Um it, my my um Christine has roots in Mississippi. So um <laughs> we 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 bonded over that and I think when I started shooting um um the Clark sisters uh I had just kind of um started thinking about um what I wanted to do I knew I wanted to do something uh, and I had given it to other people and said, can you do something with this? I didn't, mm. believe, I didn't believe enough in my writing <clears throat> to, to do it myself. I wasn't a director. I'm not a writer. So I, I, I approached other Mississippi, uh, artists to do it and nobody was really interested. And I said, well, I, this is necessary. Uh, it's necessary to tell this woman's story. Um, not just because I'm proud of her because she's a Mississippian. I it is necessary for this country to know what these band of bandits <laughs> did. <laughs> um, you know, sharecroppers, maids, farmers, um, um, uh, um, from all over the state of Mississippi got on a bus and said. Um, yeah, I know we know about this white delegation that they send every year to to say that they they represent the state of Mississippi. But we, in fact, represent the state of Mississippi and we're going to go to New Jersey and we're going to take those delegate seats. So the audacity of that. Right. For mm -hmm. them to do that. And they went to they went to the Democratic Convention in 1964 and really upended it, completely disrupted it, made Lyndon Johnson angry. And essentially, because of their efforts, the Democratic Party had to live up to its own convictions and say, we will never allow an all-white, all-male delegation to come to the convention ever again to represent a state. And that happened because of those, uh, you know, those people, those people, those farmers and sharecroppers and maids for Mississippi, the world needs to know what they about what they did. The Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, and Mrs. Hamer was at the helm of that. Hanky to to the max. Yes, <laughs> yes. And Miss Watson, you know, one of the things I thought about in putting thinking about this moment is 
I teach Fannie Lou Hamer and sometimes through Monica White's book, um, who does some good work on it. But I realized when I first saw Fannie that there's not a lot of visual material where she is present speaking. There's a lot where there's somebody giving a voiceover and you hear a moment of her because mm-hmm. she's very profound. And so it's obvious to me on one level why you chose what you chose, but were you, did you have to wrestle if it, since it's a short film with how am I going to show Fannie Lou? Is it, is it just this? Do I need to do more than one speech? How am I going to work for the audience who may not know her, who may not be like me, who sat as a little boy and watched that on TV mm. when she was on the screen in the, in the, dem- uh, the delegation? How did you decide what it was, how long the audience that needed to see this? Can you talk to that, Ms. Swanson? Yeah, it's, sometimes it's about what are your limitations mm-hmm. and um, what what are you working with, right? So we we received a grant, a $10,000 grant from um, this place called Chromatic Black. And mm-hmm. um, Anjanu has suggested, you know, we should do a proof of concept of some sort about Fannie Lou Hamer so people can learn about her in a in a quick kind of way. So mm. we got we had ten thousand I had ten thousand dollars and I had Anjanu Ellis. Mm. So and I had one day to shoot this because that's about <laughs> as far as uh ten thousand dollars stretched, right? And pretty much I think I don't know how we came up with this specifically but we knew that we had to hear uh, Mrs. Hamer speak. So what better way to to see that than to um, like uh, redo her speech, right? Mm-hmm. And it was in shooting that speech as Anjanu was revving up, like um, I had a different way of approaching this, but really um, how Anjanu embodied Mrs. Hamer really spoke to what the specific visual style was going to be. Like once she started to embody her, every plan that I had um, to shoot anything wide went out the window. And I don't know if Anjanu knew this, but I was telling the crew like, scrap this, scrap that, get get some black duvety behind her and then move the camera in. And from that point on, it became a, a short film of close-ups from multiple angles that we just started to put together to, 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 to see the story that you have. So it's, we, when you have like an Anjanu Ellis, it's, it's what she does in front of the camera actually spoke to me like in real time. And that determined um, the visual language of the storytelling. I'm so glad you said that. Cause that was one of my other questions because in everything I've seen her in, her face can be a whisper or a scream at, mm-hmm. at, in a moment. She can turn on a dime on that level. And I was so glad when I saw that, that it's so tight. It's so tightly focused because right. it makes you really have to be there. And I'm curious also, what, what are your thoughts as we move? Forward? I mean, I know it's on YouTube, but for me, selfishly as an academic, mm. it's an ideal thing to put in a classroom because it's just mm. long enough to have a text, to have a discussion, Today, we I was going over the complexity of our histories, and I mm-hmm. spoke about the Montgomery bus boycott and Rosa Parks, but then I said, we have to talk about Claudette Colvin. We have mm-hmm. to talk about Emmett Till mm-hmm. and Rosa deciding on the 100th day after his torture and murder, that's when I'm going to sit down. And mm-hmm. so I think you, you're giving us a great opportunity yeah. to take a, a text and then open it up for people to investigate further it, it, but, but let, let me say this like um this this is a small snapshot of a larger um tapestry um of work that Anjanu completed in a, in a feature film uh screenplay about Fannie Lou Hamer so that screenplay and and I've said this and Anjanu is gonna get embarrassed or whatever but it, it really was one of the best scripts I've ever read in my life because mm-hmm. it came to life on the page and mm. I thought about this over and over again and like I struggled with it because Anjanu would ask me to read it and like I'd, I'd be trying to uh 
just correct like the language or something. And then after a while I stopped because what I realized was um, um, this was a living, breathing thing in the spirit of Zora Neale Hurston. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the, the language itself is part of the artistry. And when I, when, when that hit me, I was like, we're onto something that I've never seen or experienced um, in the most organic way um, that it has been done by a Mississippi artist who happens to be an actress, uh, who, who, who a absolutely adores the life and legacy of, of this civil rights leader. And, and it's, it's, it's just all just happening like in this moment that I think we're, we're ready to hear Mrs. Hamer's story. So the short is a snapshot of a larger tapestry that is brilliant in and of itself. It, it's, it's an award-winning script. Um, and our hope was to make that into the full length, full length feature. And the short was to serve as a proof of concept for that. Okay, so we have something to look forward to. Sure. Yep. We hope. <laughs> we hope. Maybe, uh, well, maybe I we think can based talk on to some domers to, to, to uh, contribute yeah. to contribute to okay. that. Plot. We'll we'll get that movie made in a heartbeat. Let's go. Okay, folks, you hear all that? We know that Ms. Duvernay had to do a similar thing to get origin made and, and do it another way, do a workaround like we do. So I think that's a great opportunity for us to move this forward. Well, Amen. Um, so the, just out of curiosity to speak a little bit more about that project, will it always be a one woman project or will it also integrate others? Or do you not want to say? No, no, Anjali, talk about the screenplay. Uh, yeah, it, um, what I tried to do <clears throat> with the, um, uh, with the story is to, first of all, get us, I, I wanted people to understand that Ms. 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 Mrs. Hamer was a miracle before she stood up in front of the, before she sat down in front of that credentials committee in, in 1964, that if, if if none of those things happened to her, she would be considered um, a hero and a pillar of her of her community. In the same way that so many of our grandmothers and mothers during that time were, they. I mean, Mrs. Hamer was a contemporary of my grandmother, and my grandmother was a superstar in her own right. But y'all don't know her, right? Mm -hmm. But they were doing that. They were doing that work of community building. They were only a few years into having the legal right to vote. So they were taking people to to the polls. They were uh, educating folks about about voting, encouraging people to go vote. But it wasn't anything that they needed the Presidential Medal of Freedom for. They did it because it was that's what they were supposed to do in the middle of they're going to church four and five times a week, um, going to visit the sick and shut in, feeding people. This me growing up with my grandmother, that was just a part of my life with her, witnessing this woman be who Fannie Lou Hamer was. But the only difference was my, my grandfather owned our farm. Mrs. Hamer was a sharecropper. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show, I wanted to show the quotidian hero that Mrs. Hamer was. Um, so, and, and then also that, that movement, the freedom rights movement in Mississippi was very much women led. Um, so that was a huge part of that. And the reality was from everybody from Aaron Henry to Dr. King to Roy Wilkins, to Bayard Rustin, to um, uh, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., uh, who else? All of these men stood up against her. Yeah, what she was doing, and 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 in fact, were um, were in many ways betrayed her. 
um, sure. in her efforts. So I, that I, I'm trying to, I have tried to capture, tried to capture all of that in 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 what I've written. Can we just sit with that for a minute, everybody? A few things I want to reiterate that was just said. Because this is not just in Mississippi. When we think about the Selma to Montgomery march, it was women who coerced King and others to do that. They were going to take Jimmy Lee Jackson's body and walk it from Selma to, to Montgomery. So we have to acknowledge the women. I appreciate and respect all the men you mentioned, and they're very important to our history. But so much of the change agents in our cultural history around race and civil rights are women. So much of them are everyday women. And I constantly say in my classroom to my students at 15, at 20, would you do this? Would you stop what you're doing and take this kind of stand in spite of and because of all that you have else in front of you? Because what you've just said is very profound and people really need to sit with it for a minute. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it's without these women, I mean, for me, without black women, we're nowhere. We are nowhere because you all are the ones who really light the fire. Um, I want to make sure with time, if we're at a place where we should be showing the film, because I know around this point, we're supposed to actually share the film. Because um, I could keep talking, keep asking you questions, but I want to make sure because I've seen it, you've seen it, you're in it, but I want the people who haven't to be able to appreciate it as well. Um. Excuse me. So, yes. So I'm going to let the tech gods do what they do because we are at the point that they're going to show the film. For those of you who don't know, it's about nine minutes. So we'll be here. Enjoy the screening. We'll come back and we'll talk about it on the other side. Mr. Chairman, and to the Credentials Committee, my name is Mrs. Fannie Lou Hamer, and I live at 626 East Lafayette Street, Ruleville, Mississippi, Sunflower County, the home of Senator James O. Eastland and Senator Stennis, where I have lived and worked as a sharecropper and timekeeper for 18 years. In August of 1962, I went to try to register to vote. When I came back home, I was met by the plantation owner. He said to me that if I didn't go down there and withdraw my registration, I would have to leave. He said that we're not ready for that in Mississippi. I told him, that I did not register for him, I registered for myself. I left that same night. On June 9th, 1963, I had attended a voter registration workshop and was coming back home to Mississippi. It was 10 of us traveling by Continental Trailways bus. When we arrived in Winona, Mississippi, which is in Montgomery County, some of us wanted to use the, the, the washroom, to use the restaurant. They were ordered out. During this time, I was on the bus, and I looked through the window to see that they had rushed out. I got off the bus, and one of the ladies said that it was the state highway patrolman and chief of police ordered them out. I got back on the bus, and no sooner than I had got back on the bus, I looked out the window and saw that some of us had been placed in a state highway patrolman's car. I got off the bus to see what happened, and one of them said, get that one there. 
And when I went to get in the car, and the man told me I was under arrest, he kicked me. They took me to county jail, and they placed me in a cell. And I began to hear the sounds of licks and screams. I began to hear the sounds of licks and horrible screams. And somebody yelled, can you say yes, sir, nigga? Can you say yes, sir? Can you say yes, sir, nigga? Can you say yes, sir? And they would use other horrible names. She said, yes, I can say yes, sir. Well, then say it. She said, I don't know you well enough. They beat her I don't know how long. And after a while, she began to pray and ask God to have mercy on those people. It wasn't too long before three white men came to my cell. And one of those white men was a state highway patrolman. He asked me where I was from. I told him Ruleville. He said, we are going to check on this. It wasn't too long before he came back to my cell and he said, you from Ruleville, all right? We're going to make you wish you was dead. They carried me from that cell and placed me in another cell with two Negro prisoners. The state highway patrolman gave the first Negro prisoner the blackjack. The first Negro prisoner ordered me by way of the state highway patrolman to lie down on the bunk bed with my face down. I laid down my face on the bunk bed and the first Negro began to beat. I was holding my hands behind my back on my left side because I had suffered from polio when I was six years old. I was beat by the first Negro prisoner until he was exhausted. And then the state highway patrolman gave the blackjack to the second Negro prisoner. The second Negro prisoner took the blackjack and began to beat. And then I began to work my feet. And then the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro prisoner that had beat me to sit on my feet to keep me from working my feet. And I began to scream. And then a white man came over and beat me on the head and told me to hush. My dress had worked up high and, and one white man, he, he came over and he, and he pulled my dress and I tried to pull my dress down and he pulled my dress up. All of this on account of that we wanted to register to vote and become first class citizens. I question America. See, Mississippi, Mississippi is a rough place. They not going around carrying out lynching like they used to. But they keep you from eating. They starve you to death. All of this is happening right now, right now in Mississippi. And see, Mississippi is not Mississippi's problem. Mississippi is America's problem because if America wanted to do something about Mississippi, it would have done so by now. Over these two years, all these churches have been bombed and, and burned. And nobody said nothing about it. Nobody did too much about that. But you let something be burned down by a black woman and oh my God. That flag is drenched in our blood. Because so many of our ancestors was killed because we never accepted slavery. That flag is drenched in our blood. That flag is drenched, drenched in our blood. This country was built on the black backs of black people all over this country. That flag is drenched in our blood. They know what they done to us. They know what they done to us. I question them. I question them. America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I really don't know where we go from here. I question, I question America.
Oh. I have seen this film at least six times, and I'm stealing myself to not burst into tears. And each time I see it, I'm deeply moved. That for me is an expression of both of your work. There is so much I'd like the audience to think about what you've done with silence in your speech, with slight gestures in your eye, a slight cock to your chin, or holding a word in suspension. And for Ms. Swanson, the way that you shot her, photographed her, the way that you work together to reiterate and give extra emphasis to certain phrases through repetition or a sh slight shift in camera angle. I want to also ask everybody to think about what the people in the room were doing. There were a couple of men who were writing and not paying attention. Why couldn't they put their focus there? Most of the women, white women, were hearing it. And for those of you who don't know this history, the president of the United States, Lyndon Baines Johnson at the time, made a special presidential announcement to try to preempt it so it wouldn't get heard. So we wouldn't know this story. We wouldn't have heard this brilliant woman articulate so well that now we get to see in a new way with a very visceral interpretation by Ms. Swanson and Ms. Ellis Taylor. I can't thank you both enough. This is just transcendent. And this is only the proof of concept. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I saw I I I it's hard it's hard for me to it's hard for me to watch. So I, I made myself I made myself watch it. Um and I'm glad that I did because I just see I just see the work of of Christine. Um, mm. I just think it's just, it's just great. It, it just really is. It, it, it is, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm become lacking words at the moment, but it, I mean, I think you, 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 you said it, it, it it's the way that she made certain things in the editing that she made certain things land. It, 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 it the the repetition the 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 moments that she just allowed she just just insisted that the camera be on Mrs. Hamer's face my face um and just I didn't know she was doing that <laughs> you know I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know she was doing those things you know I was just just sitting there and I guess, I don't know, feeling what I was feeling, but she felt that it, it worked for the, the undertow of, mm -hmm. of the speech. Um, yeah. I, I just, I think it's really extraordinary work, Christine. It really is. Yes, exactly. And I love that when you do cut away and we see the people in the gallery and have to think about them thinking about a regular black woman coming to them with this profundity. That still is something we have to consider today. Mm -hmm. This is what I, you know, I'm, I think a lot of in looking at this about Stacey Abrams asking people to vote and then vote again, if you don't see who you want get elected. These stories are, we haven't progressed enough. And that's why we need a film like this. Um, Ms. Swanson, I'm curious if there's something you'd like to say. You mentioned already how you threw out a lot of your preconceived ideas of how to shoot. But as um, Ms. Ellis Taylor just said, we have to also consider editing. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, I have a great editing partner who uh, has worked with me for over 15 years and um, it just became a uh, just a, 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 a fun exercise of maximizing uh, minimalist kind of moments. Mm -hmm. Yet yeah, they they loom largely and speak loudly. You know, um, 
I'm, 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 a, I'm a feeling kind of director. So sometimes I tell actors like, hey, I might just be standing around you, but don't get spooked out. I just, I, I feel the wavelength of creativity in the air. And, and sometimes Anjanu gets very um, meditative and she likes to listen to her music. And like, it's just, I just happened to capture her doing that. And it felt like she was in this really contemplative state. And I was like, yeah. you know, to my cinematographer. And we just caught her in these um, deep moments um, that maybe one could miss. But in the, in the feeling state that was created, it was screaming to be captured. Yeah, I, I feel that. And particularly there's moments, I'm thinking of a moment where she slightly bows her head and closes her eyes. That might have been one of those contemplative moments. And Mrs. Hamer isn't speaking. So you're getting to really just sit with the person, really just feel what is this Black woman experiencing? Absolutely. What does it mean to her to say these things to them? Mm -hmm. um, that makes it even all the more resonant. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard to come up with words because it's so visceral. Um, I'm a very emotional person, I will say, and it's just got me to my gut, which is what's net needed. And I think, you know, kudos to you to take us all the way there and then hold it. Because if we think, if, if we think about filmmaking, generalization don't like to make them but often people get you to that place but they go away from it right away you took us there and you held it you mm -hmm. held it you were like it was a mahalia moment mm -hmm. where you're just let's hold on to that note take it up a little higher let's mm -hmm. keep going we got to be here now together can you hear it can you be in it can you be with it will you get up and make a difference too mm -hmm. That's what I come away from looking at this proof of concept. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what's what's um, important and it's fun for me, but you can't do things like that unless you have an instrument that's Anjanu Ellis. I feel like what Anjanu embodies in um, her Black womanness. Um, and what she does that nobody else can do is bring a, a, a precise representation um, that comes from a deep knowing and understanding mm -hmm. of what the assignment is. Uh, th there's, there's just nothing false about it. So that, so that's that's the interesting thing. I was just capturing what she was spitting out. Um, I don't know that we even had that much discussion about how she was going to present the speech. It was, she made choices and I felt them in real time. And part of the work that we do in, in cinema that I feel is missing as it pertains to stories about our civil rights heroes is that we're just regurgitating facts Mm -hmm. this happened and then this happened and then this happened mm -hmm. and we're really missing out on the connection that 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 speaks to the right now mm -hmm. as opposed to just being uh, a regurgitation of a history book so it mm -hmm. doesn't it doesn't come alive in, in, mm -hmm. in a way that I think it can um, capture us and engage us into the now you know, and that's the urgency of storytelling in a in a cinematic um, format is it's visceral. And if it doesn't feel visceral, then it's like you're wasting everybody's time to me. I couldn't I agree with you more. And I think that she, Miss Ellis Taylor, has given us both the archetype and the embodiment of Black women such that Wherever her grandmother is, she is shining brightly. And you have shown them who we are. Um, and I think you're exactly right about the storytelling. When I mentioned Claudette Colvin, at the end of an interview I shared with my students, she said, 
I have full respect for Mrs. Ms. Rosa Parks, but I was a 15 year old pregnant, dark skinned black woman and the movement didn't want to have me in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. She was a better choice. That mm -hmm. complicates the story. Some of these stories have to be complicated mm -hmm. to understand what really we have lived through and what we need to struggle with still going forward. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's the texture of the storytelling that I feel that Anjanu captured in the in the written script, um, which again I, I it's inexplicable to me because I read scripts all the time, but mm -hmm. the script that she wrote just popped off the page in a visceral way that we're 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 like swimming with the ancestors. Yes, you and, feel it. Yeah. And I don't think we, we get the opportunity to live in that space unencumbered and without notes from people who shouldn't be giving us notes, you know? Yeah, I want to I want to say, you know, about something more about, you know, your choices as I hope this isn't coming across as a mutual <laughs> appreciation society thing. Pick <laughs> up on her. Pick up on her. Oh my God. Um, but I think I think this I think this is important important to say um is that your choice, Christine, a directorial choice that you made to capture to capture silence. Mm. To capture to capture the unspoken, to capture the unsaid. I just I I just it is just a, it is it is it's not it's not a matter of it, it being a good choice or a brilliant choice it is a necessary one because it's it, it is a necessary one because it says something about black womanhood and blackness that we are not permitted in our culture in our society in our history here that everything that we do is so much about our labor how we produce mm -hmm. Right. In everything, even in our art, we are constantly being, uh, you know, almost animalistic and not almost, you know, Mrs. Hamer talked about all the time being treated like an animal that we what we produce as black people in every field that we are in. It is about production and activity. Right. And so for you to say, no, I'm going to show us in silence. I'm going to show us in contemplation. I'm going to make you live with this woman's mind. It, that that is just it, it is it is such an important choice because I see <clears throat> movies that feature um, stories about the civil rights movement, freedom rights movement, and it is as you said, it is just talking heads. It is talking heads. It's an it's exchange. It's information exchange. Mm -hmm. You know, rapid, loud information exchange. Um, but we don't just live in in silence, because it if to not because in that silence you are you are suggesting that a soul is alive here, that it that it is not just it's not just it goes beyond words. It goes. It is it is a is a person that is living and breathing in a way that no one can see or no one can know but them. And that's 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 something to say. That's something to say. Well, Anjanu yes. speaks loudly in her silence. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. but we all do though we all no, we all speak sure, loudly sure. we all, yeah. and especially you know imagine the interior life of of an ella baker yes imagine the interior life of a claudette colvin imagine their interior mm -hmm. lives you know what they say yeah oh you know what other people say about them but imagine what imagine their imagination yes i mean and the power of that I, I had this um experience with my mother. She was she was ailing. And um I <laughs> me trying to be 
a good nurse, I said, she was looking in this, she was looking at the ceiling and she, I could tell that she was really deep in thought. And I said, mommy, I said, what are you thinking about? And she said to me, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. She was in the late stages of Parkinson's disease and she couldn't use her hands. She couldn't use her legs. Everything that happened or happened, someone else had to do it for her. Mm. And so she said, I can't tell you that. She said, everything has been taken away from me. Mm -hmm. All I have now is my thoughts and I mm. can't let you have that. Mm. So imagine mm. that as being black people during that time, particularly not having, not having anything that you can claim with Mrs. Hamer, her being sterilized. They went inside her and took her possibility of having children. They took every, they took it all from her. And, 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 and what you did, Christine, is say, that's some, that's a place that you can't touch. Mm -hmm. You can't touch that. Thank you for that intervention. Yeah. Very necessary. I have some questions. Before I go to the questions, I'm just curious about your writing process. Have you done a lot of writing prior to this? Was this, obviously we've already learned that this was a necessary project for you, but are, are you writing other projects that you're performing in or how is the writing process part of your craft and art? Well, it's it saves me, you know, it saves me. Um, just to just to be just to just to spend time with Mrs. Hamer, you know, during mm -hmm. the course of my day and learn from her. Um, it, it is it is it is it is a, a sort of salvation. So, um, yeah, and I am I am I am writing things, but this this is my preoccupation right now is her. Can we just rest on that for a minute, people to spend time with Mrs. Hamer and learn from her? How many of us can pick up somebody in our cultural history and think about sitting with them, whether they're present in our mortal life or ancestral spirits that could come back and work with us? That is something we could all take time to do and learn from. Thank you for saying that and sharing that. So I'm going to go through some of these questions. There's a couple of statements. Um, someone whose last name is Bass is saying, um, the session was all of that. As a Black woman, I feel heard, felt, and seen. Thank you for telling these stories. Um, they also ask about some of the things we've already talked about. Uh, but I'll say this, it sort of reiterates what we've said, but why is the voice of Black women critical to social justice? And why are women primary in your stories? Do either of you want to speak to that? If you don't want to, we can continue. Christine? Well, Angela, you know, I think you can attack the one why are uh, Black women important to stories? No, about no, no, I think you need to. Okay, well, my quick answer would be is there would be no social justice today as we know it. Uh, I know we have a ways to go, but mm -hmm. to the extent that we are where we are today, um, it, it would not be possible without Black women. And particularly a lot of the Black women uh, who worked in the civil rights movement. Um, that's that's one of the things that Andrew and I go back and forth about is like, is really the women behind the scenes uh, who kind of made everything happen, but in the era that we were living in, they could not be in the forefront in the yes. way that the men were. So yes. this, this, I think um, what Anjanu is trying to do is tell us civil rights story. That's the genre, um, but told from a, a, a Black female perspective, which I don't think that's been done um, in, in, in the wide, wider feature film format um, in, in, in a convincing way. Uh, told from a black woman's point of view. So Perfect. that's that's because they're 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 at the forefront of social justice. We're talking about Stacey Abrams again, um, who pretty much saved democracy, depending on how you want to look at it, um, 
yet again another black woman. So mm -hmm. it, it behooves us to to con consider um, who was the Stacey Abrams before Stacey Abrams, and it's is is really on many levels Fannie Lou Hamer, whose story uh, most of us don't know. Um, I didn't know it until I met Anjanu. Uh, now I think over four years ago, and it's it's kind of embarrassing, like as an adult, to to understand like this woman existed um, in the way that she did, and we've heard we've had how many movies uh, about Dr. King, and it's great, it's necessary, and so be it. Um, we've yet to have a, 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 a an appropriate film done in the way that Mrs. Hamer deserves. So I have a couple of questions I'm going to try to bring together. Someone's asking, who sounds like they are involved with creative activities, um, how do we as artists use our creativity to assist in larger framework of social justice? I think that you both are doing it, and I think it's applying yourself within your community, um, within your knowledge sector, or taking time to learn and research what you think is valid. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Um, I'm going to, while you're thinking, I'm just going to say this as a comment. Uh, someone, uh, last name Anderson wants to thank you both immensely for bringing this incredible piece of history to life for all of us. As an immigrant, I did not know the depths of Mrs. Hamer's contribution to the civil rights movement, although I knew of her. How do you as an actress prepare yourself emotionally to deliver and convey that depth of each person or character you embody in your work? Is the question after that comment. If he, do you um, want to go, go. yeah i would uh, in th in terms of um my preparation for the short um and i loved that i just saw this christine you said written by fanny lou hamer i love that i was like all right now <laughs> um it started with the words it started with her words um saying her words over and over again. And Christine had the an, another great idea of fusing her uh, testimony that happened in front of the credentials committee at the Democratic Convention with um, comments she made in an in, in interview. So really the last, I would say the last uh, part of it when, when she starts saying I question America that 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 actually came from an interview that that she did. So for me, um, uh, in terms of my preparation for that, it it starts with the words um, and and finding finding her, finding the character, finding the emotion as much as I can from that. Thank you. A comment um, from Phyllis Stone. There are so many unknown women. My mother was a reporter and told many civil rights stories for the Chicago Defender, telling stories of Black women behind that movement. She herself had a story. She made the walk from Selma to Montgomery, and I have all of her newspaper clippings from every civil rights story she ever wrote. Mm -hmm. Such important work. Thank you for what you've done. Mm -hmm. For Christine, there's a question. Uh, I'm going to try to put two together. One is, how do you... Um, has the reception of Fannie influenced your approach to future projects? And how has Notre Dame influenced your career in filmmaking and working particularly in the area of social justice? Um, well, it was, let me start with the second question. Um, I was a freshman at Notre Dame and I was a finance major. I double majored in <laughs> finance and Japanese. And see, Anjanu is laughing because I don't know what I thought I was doing. And um, I took my first econ course and I really thought they were speaking Greek and I was a little frightened. So um, by God's grace, Spike Lee came to campus my freshman year, first semester to talk about do the right thing. And as I was listening to him speak, I was like, oh, people make movies for a living. Like I had <laughs> no idea. I grew up in Detroit. Nobody was shooting in the streets of Detroit. I mean, well, they were shooting, but, but you know, shooting films, you know. So, so I was like, oh my gosh, that's what I want to do. That's it. So I promptly changed my major to, um, back then it was called communications and theater. 
And then I did research on Spike Lee and I learned that he went to NYU graduate film school. So my freshman year at Notre Dame, I I decided to be a filmmaker and I I knew I had to go to NYU film school. So I just set my sights on that. And uh, as luck would have it, I got into NYU film school and my last year in my youth, Spike Lee was my directing teacher. Mm. That's crazy. That is crazy. Just, just to say, as I recall, you are also the Willard T. Johnson Fellow at NYU, which is a prestigious fellowship given to the student who had achieved the highest standards in his or her work. Yep. So, so that you- was. It was one of those competitive cutthroat scholarships that we killed each other for. But um, back then, I think the faculty felt like I had some promise. And so they invested a little money in me. So I ended up going to NYU for free. Yeah. Um, Okay, I have two other questions we're going to try. For Ingenue, over the course of your career, you've demonstrated a chameleon-like ability to appear almost disappear into your characters because you are so committed to fully inhabiting them what is the process like for you as a person as a woman and as an actress when you have to bring us to these very raw places and sit with it sit with them i guess um you know i i i think that you know, for me, do, doing this kind of work is exhilarating. I I enjoy it so much. I really do. So um, I get asked sometimes, like, how do you decompress? And, mm-hmm. you know, after having to, you know, do things that are, can be so, you know, um, seemingly emotionally taxing, you know. Um, but I don't have to do that. And I think the reason why is because I feel like I feel I feel that I'm doing something that is important. And because of that, um, I'm I, I'm invigorated by it. I, as I said, I'm, I'm exhilarated. I get so I get joy out of it. I get joy out of having the opportunity to do it. Um, so. I don't need to come decompress. I come home and I, you know, fall asleep, <laughs> watch <laughs> TV, call, call Christine, call my real, you know what I mean? Like I'm, yeah, uh-huh. I'm good. I'm good. You know, I think, I think, you know, if I'm on set and, you know, I'm, I'm being asked to be, to, you know, go somewhere emotionally and have to do it over and over and over again. And when it starts to feel fake to me, then I have to say, no, I, I can't, I can't do that, you know, because I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm digging into something that's not who I'm playing. I'm digging into something that's, you know, nobody's paying to see me on camera, you know? <laughs> so I, I, I try to, I try to be very, very mindful of that. But, you know, when you're doing something that you don't believe in, that's when you, you know, I don't know how else to say this, but that's when you have to do the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> so to speak metaphorically yes <laughs> i feel you um and i think precisely what you said is resonant because we come to see you because you go to that place mm-hmm. that really is the core of the human experience and the human can express the human condition So there's a question here that is a little bit confusing. It's a very simple question, but it's confusing to me. And I'll say why. I see what I just saw as a piece of art. And as a piece of art, you're expressing a moment in historical time and giving us a layered version, vision of it. The question is, how do you balance artistic expression with historical accuracy in your work? Mm. And so I'm curious how you think about that. Well, we did this a couple of <clears throat> times, like when we did the Clark sisters mm-hmm. movie, we're dealing mm-hmm. with real living, breathing people who are still alive. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, but then the baton is handed to us to tell their story 
in a uh, hopefully remarkable uh, and yet believable way and yet entertaining. I hate that word, but mm -hmm. there it is, right? Um, you want to engage the audience, right? Yeah. Um, what was kind of cool about doing this short film is that there was really no thought to entertaining people or, um, you know, things of that nature, but it was important to engage people in this character and in her storytelling, because if we're getting, we were getting, we were using this as a proof of concept, we needed to, uh, capture people's attention. And if we could do that in a, in this nine minutes, Imagine what can happen in a full feature film. And in many ways, um, I think it worked powerfully. It's been used as a teaching tool all across the country. It almost made the shortlist for the for the Oscars. It won a few um, festival awards and it's really had some legs. The, the next thing that needs to happen is that it needs to be made into a feature film. And I, I, I just believe given timing, that's going to happen. So the responsibility uh, for artists um, is 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 to put our thumbprint on what we do mm -hmm. in the way that only we can do it. Mm -hmm. uh, the weight of accuracy and and honoring somebody and like. Lots of times it's like, we just don't want to, we just don't want to mess it up is, is great. That's always there. Mm -hmm. But, but then you kind of move that to the side and you get to the work and um, it's, it's just about gra grasping that truth as it's unfolding. And somehow I just believe when our intentions are pure and uh, there's alignment with the vision and the and, and the goals of of a of a Fannie Lou Hamer, um, and then you get somebody like Anjanu Ellis, who, uh, again, there's just something you about her inexplicable being from Mississippi and and this just being part of um, who she is. You put all that in a bag and you shake it up and you just throw it on the wall. <laughs> and it's I guess that's what we call art. But um, the, the, it's it's not that simplistic. And yet at the same time, like I said, we had these tools. We mm -hmm. had this amount of time. And we had this amount of resources. And this this is the offering that we offer up to our ancestors uh, using our sweat equity and, and our hearts and our passion. And they say I say. Mm -hmm. Um. I want to mention one thing before I go to the uh, last few questions that um, Ms. Ellis Taylor said as Fannie Lou Hamer, and it resonated with me because um, of the horror. Uh, in the film, she talks about how she was beaten by other Black people. And this, to me, is a Mississippi thing, because this is what got Booker Wright killed, mm -hmm. who was a waiter at Lusco's, who happened to be able to recite the whole menu but he also said people call him a nigger. Some people call him John, some people call him boy. And the Klan had a, another black man who they got him out of prison. So he would kill Booker. So you're killed by your own people. And that's a complicated construction that I want people to sit with as well, because that is so divisive and so reflective of that period. Um. So for what you've just said, both of you, I'm assuming this proof of concept is going to go all the way to the stars. But do you see other stories coming forward about other women of the movement or even prior movement, prior to the movement, historical figures you'd like to engage with in this dynamic way? Oh, well, my goodness. Yeah. Um so many i mean we we um miss mrs baker miss baker mm -hmm. she, she demands her own mm -hmm. her own talent um but we she's she's featured prominently in um in um in the story in in sunflower sunflower is the name of the story that i've written about mrs hamer so she's she's she mrs baker's miss baker's featured prominently in that um so yes, I mean there there are so many there are so many stories, um, political, artistic, 
um, um when, when and when you say visual you mean i mean artistic i mean visual arts i mean literary arts i mean um music um was that a tharp is someone that i've been thinking about a lot um so yeah i mean it's it's extraordinary and 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 it's 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 extraordinary and it's necessary work everyone who is listening to me now i mean and and it's not it is not just so it would be so cool to see this i mean it, if it's not happening in classrooms i mean and, and there's an there's an there's a move an active move to we are already not present in 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 hit in in curriculums of history across this country mm -hmm. particularly in the south and what is there there's a move to redact what is there already that is what is behind the banning of books all over the south on um, other parts of the country so the space that we can take in cinema and film and television is where we can do that work so all of you who are listening to me right now you know this this is this is not just art for art's sake this is our um 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 you know our fighting for our existence our very existence in this country and the record of that existence thank you and to me that comes off better with independent filmmaking than when the big buck projects then glorify it because it does exactly what you spoke of just talking at us not really getting to the heart of it so somebody's asking a question that i want to i'll say it but i want to reframe it too they're asking about how you approach telling stories of historical figures in a way that resonates with contemporary audiences and i already said how i've used this film in class but i'm actually more interested not that i don't respect the question if there's somebody, let's say, of your grandma's generation who's still alive, how has this film shown to elders who might have been adult when Fannie Lou Hamer was alive? Have you had screenings where you're dealing with our parents and our grandparents' generation? And what is how do they react to it from, mm -hmm. for either of you? Hmm. I'm not sure that we had a formal screening, but um, later on in, in, in this month, um, it's Fanny's going to screen in Mississippi. And I, I don't know who's going to be there. It's at a festival called the Magnolia Film Festival, um, which that's exciting for me to actually screen this movie in Mississippi for Mississippians. Yes. Uh, and I think that's another great idea is if we can gather like our ancestor types or our grandmothers and and the seniors and and have them screen this room um as a collective experience would could be awesome we just i don't I, think we formally have done that yet if i can just encourage you my dad was born in massachusetts but his father was a great migrator from tennessee and twice in my life i tried to get him to go to columbia where his he grew up going to and once he lost his address book pre-internet for two weeks until we were farther west of Tennessee. The second time we were going to go there and I was at the exit, go, don't get off the highway. So obviously it meant something. So when I asked him after he refused, I said, he goes, well, I went through that so you don't have to. And the conversation didn't go past that. Mm -hmm. So I think, I hope, I wish that if you're able to do that, there might be conversations, even worthy of filming, that come up from people who know this in their bones and their blood. That's a that really be... great idea. That's a really great idea. We should, Christine. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And, and one, of the, one of the, we're adamant about shooting it in Mississippi because Mississippi is a character. Um, mm -hmm. in so just to, grasp that and 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 i think we discussed the idea of using real mississippian who are non-actors as well um to, to you know just just a part of the storytelling that just keeps it grounded in in realism too true um okay i'm almost at the end of these questions somebody's asking for advice you would give to artists looking to use their platform their creativity for social change If you have anything to say about that. 
that's a big question. Um, yeah, I know. I, I, it, it's not like we, Anjanu and I just woke up and we're like, we're going to do this with social change. Uh, Anjanu actually is, is, is a real activist who's taken down Confederate flags in Mississippi. So I think she's an activist who happens to be an actress. And then she combines that together um, in her work as well. So go on, away. girl, get it. Yeah, I, I would say to me, you know, with, if I can put in my two cents, this is a calling. This is not like I'm dieting for a week to fit into this outfit. This is something that if you're, if this calls you out, it becomes part of your daily practice. It becomes part of the way your mind works. And so my suggestion would be for somebody who's interested in trying to understand how to use their platform is to look at their life, their community, their people they came up with and think about what change is needed and what part of that they can actively participate in, whether it's intellectually, physically, in some applied way or theoretically, but it's not something of a moment for this week. And next week, I'm going to do something else. Um, there are a few more questions, but I feel that we've expressed the tenor of the questions. We're about close to closing. So I'd like to ask either of you if there's something you would like to share that you haven't already or if you have a question for each other. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um. Oh no. I well, I I know that I I I feel that I really appreciate your um um I appreciate um the questions that you've asked um um, Scott, if I can call you Scott, um, yes, you can. <laughs> um, I think, I think they were thorough and, um, I actually, while you were talking, I'm, I'm writing down some of your references because I'm not aware of, of, of some of that history. So when I get off, when I get off of this, I'm, I'm about to go, <laughs> I'm about to go, um, look up some of these things. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I want to spend my time thanking you. Um, oh, that's so sweet. For your generosity and your um, your your knowledge. Um, so yes, that's what I would say. I don't know what I would ask Christine. I feel like I've asked Christine <laughs> everything that could be asked of her. She's probably tired of my my question. <laughs> So I have one circle. I, I love the circle we've created. I have one more seed I want to plant. So I had an opportunity. I used to be on the board of the Southern Foodways Alliance. It's out of Oxford that does work around the South, um, around food and culture. And while I was on the board, we had a, a trip, a, gr a group trip to um, Montgomery and Birmingham. And I met then older women. I'm sure they're all gone. The only one I know who's famous was Fred Shuttle, Reverend Shuttleworth, Fred Shuttleworth's wife. But there are all of these women that we don't know about who every day, they were hairdressers and maids, like you said, they were frying chicken and making sandwiches because of the strictures the white power elite had put on the people marching from Selma to Montgomery. So they would make these carpools to bring food to the marchers. And there's a story in that. I don't know how to tell it, but it's about that everydayness of black women who didn't stop working. If they were a hairdresser, when they got done doing hair, they made whatever it is they were good at. And they had set up a system of carpools because they had to truck it out there because they couldn't buy any food on the on the route. Um, and I and there's I don't know how that story could be told. And like I said, most of those women you don't know, we will never know their names. They're not written in history. And the only one I know who was supposedly a good cook who participated, because Fred Shuttlesworth was one of the people who helped plan it, along with C.T. Vivian, was his wife was supposedly one of the cooks. But it's an interesting thing, since I study food, about where food radically changes our lives and our politics. 
Christine, um, I'm going to give you the last word. But I'm sorry, okay. I got to just, I'm sorry, I got to say two things before I have two questions. Uh, I have a request, um, question. Do you, did you know Valerie Boyd? A little bit, yeah. You know, my partner, Michelle, worked with her and I knew her peripherally, not really well, but uh, many people in my circle were deeply engaged with Valerie. Yeah, she, she, I know she did um, some work with the Southern. Um, yeah, uh, no, she, I know yeah. her, but I didn't know her as well as some of my closest friends and my life partner. Um, yeah, um, an, an extraordinary woman. Everybody should. Yes. Be Wrapped in wrapped in rainbows, mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is the the person, the woman who said that her mother um, was a uh, newspaper journalist. Yes, yes, from the that's a whole story. That Chicago Defender, oh. that, that's a whole story. But I I want to recommend to her to please, please, please try to get those uh those um articles archived somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, that because that is people need to people need to see that, those articles. Please try to do that. And I, I don't have any kind of connection to anybody, but please do that. S some university would want those articles. And just as a footnote to what you're saying, one of the things people don't often realize is that in the South in this period, they recognized the white journalists coming from the Northern newspapers, but they didn't see the black journalists as professionals or as people. So often the black journalists were right at the center of what was happening. And then they would meet with some of the white journalists who could get the stories in the New York Times or wherever. And so there, without those journalists like her mother, some of these stories wouldn't have gotten out to the Ch Chicago Defender or CBS News or, or, or the Washington Post. So yes, we need those people to archive, to find a way to preserve. Yeah. So, Christine, you have the last word. Uh, last word. I, um, I, I, I think artists like Anjanu Ellis like make me better because um, there's a there's a a real passion behind um, what she's passionate about and why. And I feel like what we can do in the space that we work in, um, we can energize audiences to feel that passion that she brings. Um, I'm I'm passionate. Too, but I'm talking about Fannie Lou Hamer's story in particular. And I just believe that this is the way that we ignite the next generation. So Thank you. we need we need help. If 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 there is there's help out there, like we said, we work best in an independent space. And what we look what we can do in nine minutes. Mm -hmm. Imagine what we can do in two hours, you know? So that's that's what um excites me as an artist working with artists like Ingenue, um and such. And if you haven't seen it, go see When They See Us and Love Calf Country and of course Origin because everything this woman touches is golden diamonds. It is just fabulous. And we have no better person that I can think of. Um, maybe Viola Davis is on her level maybe, um, to express who we are and how we are who we are. So thank you. And thank yeah. you, Christine, for your excellent work as well. This yeah. has been a pleasure to me. Total thank fanboy. You, thank you, Scott. We're back February 14th, potentially. Yes. I'm trying to get I'm trying to get Anjanue to Notre Dame, but she's she's busy right now promoting origin and 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 we'll we'll see if it happens. We may have another conversation. Um, okay. Well, thank you for making this time now. I, for one, am grateful. I know the audience is as well. Thank you, thank Scott. You. Thank you, Notre Dame. Thank, thank you. Thank you, okay. everyone. Thank, thank you, you Anjanu. Bye. Bye. Thank you so, Bye -bye. so much. It has been a pleasure. And please make sure that you um, can come back to campus and see these wonderful um, women tell their story. Dr. Barton, thank you so much. I was sitting listening and was just overcome with so much emotion. I mean, if you would have seen me, it would have been a Viola Davis cry in the background. <laughs> As a Black woman watching two women describe their artistry, the magnificent way, Dr. Barton, you um, lifted their voices and gave space and time 
for emotion, for thought, for wonderings, is the type of experiences that the Black alumni of Notre Dame want to have. As you can see, I am an educator. I wear it proudly. And part of our mission is not only to enhance, but to educate, to make sure we bring opportunities like this to the forefront. So thank you so, so much. And before you go, we have another week, right? This is not you know, a, 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 an event for today. We have the opportunity to hear from many others as we come on to to um, the remainder of our Black History Month uh, programming. So thank you first for tuning in and asking questions. Thank you for your time and your engagement. This is going to be recorded. It will be put back out for you to rewatch, re-listen. We absolutely encourage you to do it. We want to see you again next week, right here, Thursday, 7 o'clock to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And this time, we are going to be looking at Black Domers blazing trails in 21st century business and entrepreneurship, really getting underneath the fact that we came from empires. We created and built those here and unfortunately had those destroyed. But how do we continue to build Black Wall Street again? We'll have the opportunity to hear from Dr. Paige Jackson, who's an Associate Director of Annual Giving, Law and Graduate Business, Christian Fisher, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, Leon Jackson, Founder of Diversity and Leadership Program. We will hear from Rashad Johnson, President and CEO of Audmar Roderick, and our very own Vice Chair, Jimmy Rayford, CEO of Dealers Wholesales. So we look forward again to seeing you again next week and the weeks after. Once again, thank you so much for your time, your energy, your insightfulness. And we absolutely thank uh, Christine Swanson and Ms. Anjanu Ellis-Taylor for their um, presence here. What a, not even just a treat, what an absolute gift. And I know the ancestors are smiling down on us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night and see you next week. Go Irish. <laughs> Thanks, Kendra. Oh, that was great. Okay, let's do this one.